a land of flowing gentle beauty where legends haunt the hillsides and wild heroes of yesteryear live on in the hearts of the people. A mysterious land of poetry and bards where the indomitable spirit of the Celtic people somehow soars across the centuries. A land of castles and cottages, of wildlife and adventure, of myth and fantasy. Wales, a green and ancient land best celebrated in song. Wales is a principality to the west of England, about the same size as the state of Massachusetts, or half the size of Switzerland. England drew half the world into the British Empire, and yet Wales has succeeded in maintaining a separate identity. Its people are part of the unique and ancient culture. Wales has a population of nearly two and three quarter million. The capital, Cardiff, lies on the south coast. Wales' other principal cities follow the coastline, while inland the rolling hills are only sparsely populated. In the north, craggy mountains are presided over by the mighty Snowdon. The story of Wales is one of the most ancient in the world and begins nearly 4,000 years ago when Bronze Age people first made this land their home. They were soon followed by the Celts, warlike tribesmen from Western Europe. Their spiritual leaders were the Druids, whose religious rites included human sacrifice. When the Normans invaded England in 1066, they soon moved across the border to the west, finally putting an end to Welsh isolation. Chepstow Castle, perched high on a cliff at the mouth of the River Wye, is a measure of the Norman king's determination to stay on Welsh soil. Today, the lovely River Wye is famous for its bountiful stock of salmon and the verdant oak, beech and chestnut trees that crowd its steep slopes. For many centuries, however, the river's position was its main claim to fame. The shipping route along the Wye into the Severn estuary was the principal link between Wales and England. It was not until 1966, however, that the marriage between the two peoples was finally set in concrete, with the building of the mighty Severn Bridge. When it was first opened, it was one of the longest single-span arches in the world. It is still a triumph of modern engineering. Just a few miles north of Chepstow is one of the most beautiful ruins in Wales. Tinton Abbey, a 12th century monastery, was a centre of monastic life and prayer for more than 400 years.
abandoned in 1536 when Henry VIII ordered the dissolution of the monasteries, partly to finalize his break with the Vatican and partly to fill his empty coffers. city of Cardiff, the Welsh capital, is living proof that Wales, though rich in history, is not lost in the past. Cardiff has a more cosmopolitan atmosphere than most other Welsh cities, and some critics have levelled the worst possible Welsh insult, accusing the city of being too English. The headquarters of Welsh language television is based here. S4C transmits a variety of programs, including a homegrown soap opera and a daily Welsh news bulletin. Welsh is an ancient Celtic tongue, more akin to French Breton than to Gaelic. It is still spoken widely as a first language, especially in North Wales. Cardiff's wealth now lies mainly in commerce, industry and tourism. It's also an important administrative centre and boasts a magnificent Edwardian civic centre. Built in the early 1900s of Portland Stone, the centre includes the law courts, the city hall and the National Museum of Wales. Inside the magnificent city hall is housed a series of beautiful marble statues to honor great Welsh heroes throughout the ages. Saint David, the patron saint of Wales, who in the sixth century traveled the principality preaching Christianity. Henry VII was the first king of England to descend from Welsh lineage. The greatest of all Welsh heroes, Owain Glyndwr, who successfully led a rebellion against the English in 1400 and united the Welsh under his leadership. Cardiff has developed a reputation as a cultural centre. St. David's Hall has become a world-famous venue for concerts and festivals. The events often feature internationally renowned artists, but also encourage the development of Welsh heritage and the inclusion of traditional Welsh instruments, as in this international festival of the harp. In the heart of the city, and in the heart of all Welsh people, is Cardiff Arms Park, home of the national sport of rugby. Any claims that the city lacks Welsh character melt away when up to 60,000 exuberant fans flock to the Arms Park. To hear the haunting echo of the Welsh national anthem at the start of a game is to feel a part of the soul of Wales.
To the Welsh, rugby is not simply a game, it is almost a religion, a way of expressing fierce pride in their national identity. Also in the heart of the city is Cardiff Castle, a magnificently preserved Norman keep built on the site of a Roman fortress. The castle was rebuilt in the 19th century for the Marquis of Bute, said to have been the richest man in Britain. Just outside the city, in the village of St. Fagans, is the Welsh Folk Museum. Here, buildings have been collected from every part of Wales and furnished authentically to show how people lived and worked. This building is a typical farmhouse from the Gower Peninsula in the southwest. The walls were painted red to protect against evil spirits. The exhibits literally bring the past to life. The corn mill is not an empty relic, but a real working mill. The miller turns the grain into flour using grinding machinery powered by a massive water wheel. The baker cooks bread, cakes and scones in a huge wood-fired oven. In the 19th century, most townspeople depended on bakehouses for their daily needs. The wood turner was also a vital member of the community, relying on pedal power to produce a wide range of household furniture. For many decades, the coal-rich seams of the Rhondda Valley were a source of great wealth for the city of Cardiff and produced the main image associated with South Wales. In 1913, this area was producing almost one-third of world coal exports. More than a quarter of a million men worked in the mines. The shifts were 12 hours long, six days a week. Paid holidays were first introduced in 1939, just before the outbreak of the Second World War. Today, most of the seams have been mined out, and there are few working pits left. Some have been preserved to keep the traditions of coal mining alive, such as the big pit at Blaen Avon. The mine was closed in 1980, but all of its machinery has been kept in full working order. Visitors, equipped with miners' safety helmets, travel down into the mine, in the cage once used by the miners. <laughs> One thousand miners used to work underground, some of them women and children. The dark, dripping tunnels would have become a familiar workplace. The men were sometimes cramped into tunnels no more than two feet high. Operating the air doors to control ventilation was a task usually given to the children who worked underground. Now their ages was anything from six, seven and eight year olds. But they do say before that period they were very much younger. Now that's all they had for a light was a candle. You can just imagine sitting at the door with a candle, can't you? You'd either knock it over, but once that door's open, with a rush of air in, out goes the light. So they could be there for an hour, waiting for official to rewrite their light. But they do say many of those children never even had a candle to start with, so they would be in the dark all day. And their ships was anything from 10 to 12 hours. I would like one of them jobs then, eh? <laughs> yeah? A lot of them boys and girls, no shoes and socks to their feet. Eh? The demise of the mining industry has opened the way for a new era of rapid business development.
cost of living and high quality of life have attracted many multinational companies to the area. The single product-based industry of the past has given way to multifaceted industries of the future. soft green hills have begun to reclaim their territory from the scarred and blackened landscape of the mining years. The death of coal has brought a renaissance and a heightened awareness of the beauty of this land. In sharp contrast to the hubbub of thriving industry is the wild coastal scenery of the nearby Gower Peninsula. There's no pressure from people or traffic here, just the quiet charm of fishermen's cottages basking in the sunshine, and horses grazing lazily in the rich pasture. On the northern coast of the Gaur, the cockle women of Penclouth still trapes up to seven miles a day across mudflats to collect the small shellfish embedded in the sand. Maureen Murley has been collecting cockles since she was a child and wouldn't choose any other way of life. I've enjoyed it. I don't think I'd change anything in my time over again. I had a chance to go to college, but uh, I wouldn't take it. I'd rather come out here in the fresh air. <laughs> well, years ago, when I used to come out here when I was younger, there was about 14 or 15 women out there in Cochrane. We used to have good old times on the horse and carts and the donkeys. But now uh, there's only uh, a few tractors out here now. Another tradition that still thrives in Wales is fishing from coracles. These unusual boats are centuries old and are still used today on the Towie River in Carmarthen, to the north of the Gower Peninsula. The method of fishing is unique. Coracle fishermen always work in pairs and stretch a net between the two boats in order to gather up the fish. It's a family tradition, handed down from father to son and generation to generation. The old gentleman that I learned to fish with, Steve Thomas, could trace his family back. He actually had a family tree. He went back down to 1537. And it went from father to son all the way. Once it gets into your blood, that's it. I mean, uh, whether you catch fish or you don't, uh, you know, it's just the way of life. And it'd be like having your right arm chopped off if it came too expensive that we couldn't fish anymore. The pretty town of Larn, on the other side of Carmarthen Bay, was home for many years to the most celebrated Welsh writer, Dylan Thomas. It was here that he wrote some of his finest poetry, including Under Milk Wood, a work which won him world acclaim. Sadly, he died in a New York hotel room 
far from his beloved wife, Caitlin, and his beautiful Lan. Dylan's poetry has immortalized the Tarve estuary. The lunar silences, the silent tide lapping the still canals, the dry tidemaster ribbed between desert and water storm should cure our ills of the water with a one-colored calm. The heavenly music over the sand sounds with the grains as they hurry, hiding the golden mountains and mansions of the grave, gay seaside land. Some of the most breathtaking seascapes in Britain are to be found to the west along the Pembrokeshire coast. This part of the coast is a bird lover's paradise. Here, fishing has been a way of life for many centuries, and the local people have learned to make best use of all the fruits of the sea. George Varney has lived in this area all his life and knows the secret places to collect a treasured Welsh cuisine. It may not look very appetizing, but this seaweed, known locally as lava bread, is reputed to have many health-giving properties, and the locals say it acts as an aphrodisiac. As a matter of fact, they say that about the cockles as well. It must be something to do with the sea in this part of the world. George processes the lava bread himself and sells it to local butchers and markets but he's not keen to share his recipe with outsiders. Uh, really, after it's been processed and cooked, you know, looking at it on, on the dish there, it looks rather revolting. But uh, believe you me, once you've tried it once or twice, um, it's an acquired taste. You'll really enjoy it. The most westerly settlement in Wales, on the tip of the Pembrokeshire coast, is also said to be the smallest city in the world. St. David's, named after the patron saint of Wales, is only a city by virtue of its cathedral. St. David founded a monastery here in the 6th century, which became famous for the exemplary behavior of the monks. The cathedral was set in a valley to keep it hidden from seafaring marauders. It was nevertheless sacked several times since it was built in the 12th century. Happily, it survived to become a center of pilgrimage for many centuries. In the heart of South Wales lies an upland landscape of beauty and enchantment. The Brecon Beacons are an artist's canvas of dappled light on empty rolling mountains and deserted moorland. The sheep farmers once eked a living from this unforgiving landscape. Very few people follow in their footsteps today, but their lonely cottages are still strewn across the hillsides.
These brooding slopes were chosen as the site for one of the most romantic castles in Wales. Harry Kennan sits majestically at the top of a sheer limestone crag that plunges 300 feet into the Kennan Valley below. It was built in the 12th century on an existing fortification dating back to Roman times and is believed to have once been the stronghold for one of the knights of the round table. North of the Brecon Beacons, the scenery changes to the gentle green fields of a rural mid Wales. Sheep have always been the economic mainstay of this area, and they come in all shapes and sizes. Welshpool Livestock Auction is the largest in Wales. At the height of the season, as many as 24,000 sheep are sold here in one day. To the uninitiated, the auction is hard to follow, but to the farmer, the rapid fire dealing spells out the difference between profit and loss. The commercial centre of Mid Wales is the coastal town of Aberystwyth. In 1872, it was chosen as the site for the first Welsh university. The National Library of Wales was begun in 1911 and was given the task of collecting and preserving all manuscripts in Welsh and other Celtic languages. Nature at its most rugged and unrelenting has found a home in North Wales. Here, the snow-fed rivers storm through the narrow valleys, providing the ideal opportunity for the average city dweller to have some fun. John Tribe used to make a living as a computer salesman, but he discovered the joy of the wild rivers of Wales. The second you leave the eddy line, which is the slack water just here, and get off into the main current, you're on a liquid conveyor belt, which is like taking a turn in the washing machine. He decided it was the life for him and with his wife Ruth, a career consultant, set up the experience of adventure on the River Trowerin. They believe this is the best possible therapy for anyone suffering from overwork or stress. In a very short time, even complete beginners can enjoy the exhilaration of shooting the rapids. Not all water sports in this part of the world are quite as energetic. Wales is a paradise for fishermen. 
The unpolluted rivers teem with a wide variety of fish. The beautiful River Dee in North Wales is an ideal spot for a relaxing day's fishing. It's worth the experience of enjoying the unspoiled countryside, even if the fish are being elusive. Well, I wish you luck. I hope you get better luck than I've had so far anyway. <laughs> need a lot of good luck to beat that, would I? <laughs> no, you're right, you won't. <laughs> Scattered throughout rural Wales are many small family-run hotels. The Tuddin Llan is a typical example. These hotels are often in an idyllic setting, and Tuddin Llan is no exception, nestling serenely in the Vale of Edarnion in Llanbrillo. Welsh cuisine has recently undergone a revival, and country hotels usually offer delightful and inventive menus. <laughs> the chefs use fresh local produce to give the dishes a special Welsh character. Of all the castles in Wales, perhaps the most famous is Harlech. Built in 1283, Harlech formed part of an iron ring of castles erected by the English king, Edward I, to subdue the Welsh. The 14 massive castles gripped North Wales from Aberystwyth to Flint. They held the territory in their thrall for nearly 120 years until 1400, when the charismatic leader, Owain Glyndwr, rose against English rule and united the Welsh behind him. Tales of Glyndwr and the mighty deeds of other Welsh heroes have been told throughout the ages by the bards. The music of Bargoid, a modern-day bard, drifts through the weathered walls of Harlech Castle, a tangible expression of the spirit of Glyndwr. Flamboyant, elegant, colourful architecture is not immediately associated with Wales, but it is to be found in delightful abundance in the fantasy village of Port Marion, just to the north of Harlech. Port Marion was the brainchild and life's work of one of Wales' most gifted architects, Sir Clough Williams Ellis. He first had the dream of building a fanciful village when he was five years old. The dream became determination when he witnessed the horror and destruction of the First World War. He vowed to build with serenity, kindness and loveliness on some beautiful unknown site. He found it in 1925. Taking his inspiration from Portofino in Italy, he gradually built Port Marion, often incorporating buildings destined for demolition from various parts of England and Wales. Sir Clough referred to it as his home for fallen buildings. The result was unique and has provided a haven of inspiration, tranquility and beauty enjoyed by artists and laymen alike. The hotel within the village is an early Victorian building extended and converted by Sir Clough before it was opened in 1926. Sadly, in 1981, 
a huge fire left the building completely gutted. The whole structure had to be taken down and rebuilt. The porcelain figure in the elegant mirror room was found the morning after the fire, blackened with soot, but otherwise undamaged. Sir Clough's grandson, Robin Llewellyn, now manages Port Marion and is carrying on his grandfather's dream, as well as his practical belief that architectural elegance can also mean good business. Many people who come here come year after year to stay for a week or, or several weeks during the course of a year. Some have been coming for over 50 years now. It's now generally agreed that uh, Port Marion is uh, a unique work of art, really more than a work of architecture. The mighty castle at Carnarvon, built in the same year as Harlech, was the military and administrative centre of Edward I's plan to dominate the rebellious Welsh. The castle and the walled town were begun simultaneously in the summer of 1283. Together they formed what was in effect the capital of North Wales, providing a safe residence for English government officials. Hundreds of labourers were shipped in from all parts of England to complete the work as quickly as possible. Less than a year after building had begun, Edward I's son was born here and became the first English Prince of Wales. The tradition of bestowing the title on the eldest born son of the English monarch has survived to the present day. In 1969, the castle was the setting for the investiture of Prince Charles. I, Charles, Prince of Wales, do become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship, and faith and truth I will bear unto thee to live and die against all manner of folks. Although Wales is still part of the United Kingdom, it has maintained a strong cultural identity unlike Ireland or Scotland, has managed to resist the erosion of the native language. A rich literary heritage continues to thrive and is encouraged at annual cultural events known as Eisteth Vodai. These are effectively contests in literature, poetry, dance, and song. Loosely translated, Eiselvod means a sitting together, an opportunity for artistic expression to overcome all barriers. The first international Eisteddfod was held in 1947, two years after the end of the Second World War, with the idea of promoting peace among all nations. The pretty town of Llangollen in the northeast, a few miles from the English border, is the setting for the event. The town's delightful buildings and quaint railway station cluster around the River Dee, spanned by one of the seven wonders of Wales, the 14th century Llangollen Bridge. Overlooking the bridge is the historic Royal Hotel, built in the 16th century. Originally called King's Head, the hotel became the Royal in 1889 after a visit by Queen Victoria. 
Throughout the 19th century, it was a regular stop for the Irish mail coaches. The hotel was also a favorite haunt for anglers, keen to get their hooks into the famous D salmon. It retains its popularity today, not only because of its central position, but also the dramatic views it offers across the River Dee to the Vale of Llangollen. The Shropshire Union Canal is the other main waterway running through Llangollen. Horse-drawn boats, once popular with Victorian tourists, still operate, providing an opportunity for the lazy enjoyment of the surrounding countryside. The island of Anglesey lies at the top northwest tip of Wales. It is linked to the mainland by the spectacular Menai Suspension Bridge, designed by Thomas Telford and completed in 1826. Anglesey received bad reviews from a famous 12th century writer, Gerald of Wales. Gerald described the island as an arid, stony land, rough and unattractive in appearance. Now, though, word of its peaceful rolling hills and beautiful coastal scenery has finally spread. The island did not escape the iron grip of Edward I. Beaumaris Castle, built in 1295, was the last of the great royal castles that ringed North Wales. Several of the houses in the town of Beaumaris are almost as old as the castle and give it a markedly English character. The old Bull's Head Inn dates back to 1472. Throughout the ages, many celebrities have stayed here, including Charles Dickens, who mentioned the inn in one of his short stories. <laughs> Wales' tongue-twisting place names quickly become familiar, and after a while, even possible to pronounce. The prefix llan, meaning church or chapel, is very common. On Anglesey, however, there is one place name that even the Welsh find daunting. A song has been thoughtfully written to help bewildered travellers with their pronunciation. That's all there is to it, so let's sing it. one of the world's longest place names, and it caused the local authorities a great headache until 1988, when the county council finally shortened it on the road signs. Llanfair Pwll Gwyngyll Gogerach Wynd Robwll Llantisilio Gugogoch is not a large town. Apart from the station and a couple of pubs, there's a well-stocked woolen store, which also sells a comprehensive collection of Welsh crafts. The mountains of Snowdonia on the mainland tower majestically over the island of Anglesey.
highest point, Mount Snowden, is 3,560 feet above sea level. Modest in comparison with most of the world's mountain ranges, yet there is a wildness and strength in these mountains that casts a spell on all who experience their beauty. Fables and myths seep from every rock and crevice here. The legendary King Arthur slew an ogre, Rita Vaur, on the slopes of Snowdon. Beautiful fairies live in these lakes and steal the hearts of mortal men who catch sight of them. Owain Glyndur himself haunts the mountains, for it is here, outlawed and defeated, that he sought shelter from the English. Climbing Snowdon is not purely the preserve of the fit and energetic. There is an easy ride to the top. The Snowdon Mountain Railway huffs and puffs its way to the summit, leaving passengers virtually unaware of the steep gradient. Completed in 1896, the railway runs for four and a half miles over an ascent of more than 3,000 feet. It is the only public rack and pinion railway in Britain. The design was pioneered in Switzerland and features a double rack rail. Snowdon is not famous for its sunshine. The weather is often unpredictable, but the magic of these mountains is perhaps experienced more keenly when the mists of Snowdonia roll mysteriously over the mountainside. In the 19th century, slate was to North Wales what coal was to the south. The giant mounds of waste looming over the town of Blaenau Festiniog are the residue of this massive industry. At its peak in 1898, nearly 17,000 men worked in the slate mines. A few small quarries are still operating, but altogether they now employ no more than 500 people. It's possible to experience the life of a quarryman at the Llechwedd Slate Caverns, just outside Blana Festinion. Llechwedd village recreates the atmosphere of a typical slate mining community. Money can be changed at the bank for the old Victorian currency and can be spent at the village shop or the miners' arms Thank pub. Thank you. Thank you. The skill of slate splitting is still demonstrated at Llechwedd. A practiced quarryman could tell at a glance how many slates of what size could be extracted from a given piece. The quarrymen worked in a team, often a family group, and their livelihood depended on skill and concentration. The slate veins closer to the surface are reached by a tramway built in the mid-19th century. Falling rocks were one of the main hazards. The miners perched on giant ladders to check for any loose stones. The 
the steep incline railway takes visitors 450 feet underground into the deep mine. The mine was opened in 1846 and flourished until the beginning of the First World War. It is still a working mine, but on a much reduced scale. The miners became used to the cramped conditions underground, but tall visitors should be wary. This huge cavern was literally carved out by the miners. When they had blasted out the slate walls, they went to work on the floor, forming a giant basin. It flooded in 1972 when the water pumps were removed and this magical lake was formed. One of the most famous towns in Snowdonia is Betasukoid set in the Gwydir forest. The 14th century church of St. Mary lies in the heart of the town. Though some modernists find the image of the Welsh choir over-romantic, it is still a very real part of Wales today. Choral music was first established in Wales during the Industrial Revolution of the 18th and 19th centuries. The choirs are still flourishing today in every part of Wales, and most are happy to allow the public to drop in on rehearsals. The Welsh may sing like angels, but they still work up a human thirst. A little liquid refreshment for the vocal cords is always welcome. Rehearsals are usually followed by a trip to the local pub for some hearty appreciation of fine Welsh beer, a tall tale or two, and perhaps another song. This beautiful and mysterious land is known to the Welsh as Cymru, which means a kind of fellowship. It is that spirit of the Cymru which best defines the Welsh. For 700 years, they have been dominated by their powerful English neighbors. And yet, their separate identity has not only survived, but is flourishing. Wales, with its rolling rural landscapes, its dramatic mountains and wild moorland, its seascapes, waterfalls and legends, may be only a small nation, but it has a great heart, a heart that sings out to the rest of the world.